Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IISD and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, Connected Cars, What Could Possibly Go Wrong by Ed Adams. We're excited you're able to join us today, set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming PSQT conference in San Diego, California, August 14th through the 19th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel Marina. PSQT is the only conference that focuses on practical best practices in every aspect of quality assurance and testing. The ongoing theme of the conference, Practical, Proven, Feasible, keeps the focus on what works. To learn more about this exciting conference, visit psqtconference.com. You may submit your questions at any time by using your question box in your GoToWebinar window. Today's presenter will answer as many questions within the time allowed at the end of today's session. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 48 hours at psqtconference.com. At the end of today's webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. At IIST, we strive to provide the highest quality educational resources for the public and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete this short survey. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Ed Adams. Ed? And hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webcast uh, wherever you are. Uh, either good morning to you, good afternoon, or good evening. I uh, will be talking about connected cars today, what could possibly go wrong. And as uh, was previously mentioned, uh, we'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentation for questions. And as I start, I want to just remind everyone about cars being part of the Internet of Things, or IoT. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was recently speaking with some engineers at Toyota, and they reminded me, uh, you know, Mr. Adams, it's not that cars are now connected to the Internet. It's that they're part of it. And just like all of these other devices that historically had been either isolated or just standalone embedded systems like building thermostats or home thermostats or refrigerators uh, or cars, anything that has power in a connection to the Internet, basically an IP address, can be and is part of the Internet of Things. In fact, we recently had an engineer at our company, and he was a security engineer, is a security engineer, and he bought a, uh, a refrigerator that had an embedded uh, small tablet in, in one of the doors. And his 10-year-old son loved it because he could run up to it and check the weather every day. And you know, one day, this particular security engineer noticed uh, a tremendous amount of bandwidth being consumed on his, on his home network. So he did some troubleshooting and was able to pinpoint it to that very refrigerator, who, uh, which had been uh, taken over and is being used as a spam server. Uh, so he, uh, he disconnected that, that particular device from his network and moved on uh, with a lesson learned. Uh, but it's a lesson for all of us to learn that uh, the more we have connected devices in our Internet of Things mania, uh, the more attack surface each one of us has in our daily lives. And the IoT is vulnerable, not just that refrigerator that we talked about, but even things like Fitbits and baby monitors had been hacked so people could, uh, could, could view what is uh, being seen in the baby monitors. Not sure why anyone would want to spy in on someone else's baby, but uh, maybe it was just because they could. Uh, but there are also high profile data breaches that affected a lot of people, like what happened at Target. Um, the Stuxnet virus from uh, years ago, which targeted specific Siemens controllers in an Iranian nuclear power plant, and that was propagated by malware that was left on USB sticks just thrown across the parking lot. And, you know, even a year and a half ago, if you told me, you know, Ed, you know, you're in the east coast of the United States, but there's this tiny little nation halfway across the world that's going to stop you from going to see a lousy movie, uh, I would have said that you were nuts. But that's just what happened with the interview and, uh, and Sony Pictures and the uh, hacktivists in North Korea. So we have a situation where uh, the Internet of Things is now everywhere. It's on wearable devices. Uh, it's in consumer electronics we use. Uh, it's in uh, credit cards, uh, it's in cars that we drive, mobile phones that we use, and it is vulnerable. But what enables the Internet of Things? What drives it? What is creating all of these, these wonderful devices that are now interconnected? Is it magic? Well, no. 
It's the magic of software. Software runs the world these days. Even hardware devices like those Fitbits and the mobile phones and even cars, which we're going to be talking about today. Software really does run the world these days. So just to give you an example, I'll give you a little bit of a test. Here are three different types of transportation vehicles. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner, an S-Class Mercedes automobile, and an F-22 Raptor fighter jet. As you can see, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner has six and a half million lines of software code. It was designed from the ground up. Uh, it was a multi-year project with six and a half million lines of code. That F-22 Raptor has 1.7 million lines of code. Guess how many lines of code that S-Class Mercedes has? It's 100 million lines of code riding around with you in your S-Class Mercedes. And that's today. That's not future cars. Not only does it have 100 million lines of software code, it has over 100 uh, computer uh, processor, processors in it, uh, five different networks, two miles of cable, more than 10 different operating systems, and software is now representing more than 50% of the total cost of that car. And those same Toyota engineers that explained to me that cars are now part of the internet as opposed to just connected to it also joked with me that they only put the, the wheels on the automobiles to keep the computers from scra scraping against the ground as it rides down the street. Uh, just an example of not only how software runs our world, but just how much software is driving around with you in your automobile. And this is an audience of professional software quality and software development personnel. You know how many software defects are common just in a thousand lines of code. Imagine how many software defects are rolling around in that Mercedes that has a hundred million lines of code. Next, let's talk about how a connected car is similar to and different than a typical computer. A computer typically is replaced every two to three years. Um, there are antivirus and malware software that runs on a regular basis without disruption, uh, has, has over-the-air software updates. Uh, there are VPNs to protect small number of users or network segments that you only want limited people connected to. And a lot of these things are very dissimilar in, in a connected car. The average span of an automobile is more than 10 years. Software updates, uh, you can't rely on it. Uh, in, inconsistent connectivity. Uh, car has to be parked for safety. Can't be uh, rolling down the, the highway at 75 and have a an software update on the fuel injection system. Uh, there are also lack of immature tools in the space for software quality and software testing. And even a lot of the standards that are in place for software engineering in the automotive industry standards such as SPICE and MISRA don't account for any type of security controls. In fact, even the quality controls are more about documentation uh, and process as opposed to actually testing the software for quality defects. Well, how large is this market and how fast is it growing? Well, connected cars, here we are in 2016. By the end of this year, there's going to be 50 million connected cars on the road. And another four years after that, it triples. By 2020, 150 million cars, connected cars, riding around on our roadways. So this challenge is not getting any smaller anytime soon. So connected cars, how might they be vulnerable? Well, you have external threats, such as Bluetooth connectivity, Wi-Fi in some vehicles now, key fobs. You have internal vulnerabilities, USB drives, uh, CAN bus, ODB2 ports uh, for um, insurance companies, such as Progressive in the, in the United States will allow you to plug a uh, small dongle into your ODB2 port, and it'll monitor uh, how well you're driving and give you insurance discounts. 
Uh, that is a highly vulnerable system. And then even intra-vehicle, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, there's lots of different ways that connected cars are vulnerability these days. And you don't necessarily have to be too close in order to have access to all of these connected systems. Even just the tire pressure monitors in cars are not just connected to the driver notification system, but many of them are able to be accessed wirelessly from uh, a meter away. Uh, In-car Wi-Fi varies, but smart keys up to 20 meters. And I'll show you a little bit later on a device that was made with about $50 worth of equipment uh, that can pretty much unlock any car. As mentioned at the early part of the webinar, not only am I CEO of Security Innovation, a cybersecurity company, but I'm also a research fellow at the Ponemon Institute. And what the Ponemon Institute does is regularly conduct surveys and analysis of security and privacy trends in various industries. And last year, we surveyed over 500 automotive supply chain companies. And what we found is it's surprisingly difficult for software engineers in those companies to secure automotive applications. In fact, the pie chart on the right-hand side indicates that 69% of respondents said that it was either difficult or very difficult to secure automotive applications. And these are the folks that are writing those software applications. There are some other survey questions listed over here on the left side. You know, uh, active, hackers are actively targeting automobiles, two-thirds agree. Uh, my company has automotive security experts, uh, two-thirds also agree. Uh, and as you can see, some of these are, um, are uh, contradictory. Uh, if you have you know, adequate security experts, you know, why is it so difficult to secure automotive uh, applications? Uh, and if anyone is interested in a copy of this research um, paper uh, and, and data from the Ponemon Institute, you can just send me an email at the end of this presentation uh, and I'll send it to you directly. Next, let's talk about the hacker threat in connected cars. How real is it? Well, many of us heard about the Jeep hack and that caused Chrysler to recall nearly one and a half million vehicles for a software glitch that allowed hackers to literally drive the car off the road. This was covered and sensationalized in, uh, in media all around the world. There are also open source car hacker manuals. In fact, what's shown on the right hand side here is the 2004 Car Hackers uh, book. It's an electronic book. It's published. Uh, and maintained by a small group of uh, open source car hackers. And uh, I believe the 2016 version of this is coming out later on this year. Well, it's not just Chrysler that gets hacked. Tesla got hacked. OnStar got hacked. OnStar is with General Motors cars. And the first OnStar remote security breach happened in 2005. Now this particular breach was a little bit different than the Chrysler Jeep hack because the OnStar breach, was, it was discovered by a university conducting research, and they only disclosed it to General Motors. They did not go public with it, unlike the researchers in the Chrysler Jeep hack. And what that allowed General Motors to do is systematically fix the problem over a number of years. Now, it actually took General Motors nearly 10 years to fix the all of the problems. In fact, the final fix wasn't uh, rolled out until 2015. And the reason is not because General Motors didn't want to fix the problem. They actually did. But the systems were so complex and built with such a Frankenstein effect that they often had to build an entire system to fix a specific problem, only to throw that away because they only used it to get to another part of the connected system that was even more vulnerable. So it literally took them over the course of 10 years and multiple iterations of software updates to finally fix the OnStar problem. And that problem, by the way, that security defect, allowed someone to remotely control any part 
of the automobile with the exception of steering and braking. So it can turn it on and off even if it were running. It could unlock the doors. Uh, it was a pretty serious breach. Uh, but thanks to the responsible closure of that particular university, General Motors was able to systematically fix the problem and it actually didn't cause anyone uh, any bodily harm uh, that's been reported in those 10 years. Uh, so if you were driving around with a GM automobile that had OnStar between 2005 and 2015, you were driving around with vulnerabilities. Uh, but that's not different than many of us driving around with vulnerabilities in our cars. Here's that device that I was mentioning. It's about cost you about $30. And you can assemble it yourself with off-the-shelf uh, off the shelf uh, hardware. And uh, it will unlock and, and open almost any keyless, uh, keyless uh, remote for car doors, as well as garage doors. And there actually have been thousands of cars stolen using these high-tech yet low-cost gadgets, uh, predominantly in Europe. Uh, here's another uh, piece of news uh, that was broken in September 2005. Uh, this is actually a vulnerability that uh, that an engineer at, at my company, Security Innovation, discovered. Uh, they were able to disable a self-driving car, one of those, uh, those Google cars, uh, just by uh, purchasing some commercial off-the-shelf laser pointers and a Raspberry Pi. It was about uh, 60 pounds uh, British uh, worth of equipment, so under $100. And they were able to spoof the self-driving car into thinking that there were other cars around it pedestrians, etc., and literally disabled the car and stopped it from driving. So I've been talking a lot about IoT security and software security and connected car vulnerabilities. Now let's talk a little bit about traffic safety. Because at the end of the day, you know, part of my job as a leader of a cybersecurity company is to help make software more secure. But there is a program that we've been involved in for nine years now, and it has to do with traffic safety. And I'm going to be talking about that uh, in a couple of minutes here, but I want to set it up by talking about some of the problems related to traffic safety. In the U.S., the leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 34 is still automobile fatalities. And it was uh, when in the 1980s, I was in high school, and uh, there was the creation of organizations such as MAD, Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving, and SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving. And unfortunately, a number of years later, uh, it is still the leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 34. And it's not just impaired drivers. They actually account for less than 20% of uh, fatalities. And fatalities and injuries also cost a lot of money and congestion. And even folks that are uh, injured in automobile fatalities is nearing 4 million each year. What we've seen in the automotive industry is an evolution of, of safety, car safety. It's gone from passive restraint, things like seat belts, to active restraint, things like airbags, which deploy upon impact, to the next generation, which is going to be proactive driver notification and, if necessary, taking action on the car itself. Now, to set this up, I have a short video that I want to play for you. It's only about two minutes, and it's going to introduce to you the Talking Cars program, which is also known as V2V. So listen along. The next breakthrough in connected cars. Vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, or V2V works by passing messages between cars and roadside equipment to alert drivers of dangers that can't be detected by even the best onboard sensors. The U.S. government plans to make this life-saving technology mandatory for all new vehicles, while other countries are testing it out. In the past, the focus has been on helping people survive crashes. With V2V, we now have the technology to avoid them. V2V is predicted to prevent up to 80% of unimpaired driver accidents, saving thousands of lives a year and making it the most important safety advance since the seatbelt. But can hackers use V2V to disrupt traffic? Can the police use it to automatically issue speeding tickets? 
Will our privacy be at even greater risk than it is today? Can we really trust the technology? All right. So I apologize if the video did not uh, stream efficiently for you, but uh, I'm sure the sound did. Uh, and um, as the moderator mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, the presentation will be made available uh, via uh, playback and recording. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, I'll provide you my email address if you'd like a copy of the presentation. So in case you didn't catch everything that was covered in that short video about the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle program, the U.S. Department of Transportation is mandating that all U.S. manufactured automobiles carry equipment that broadcasts its speed and location constantly. Basically, the U.S. Department of Transportation is trying to solve the high-speed fatality problem in this country by putting more software and more technology into your cars. Now, you would think that based on the first few slides of my presentation, that I'd think that's a horrible idea. Well, I don't. I actually think it's a pretty darn good idea. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. My company has been involved for nearly nine years in helping define this vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure program to ensure the security and privacy of all of the messages that get communicated. I'll explain a little bit more. Now, when I mention the U.S. Department of Transportation is mandating this, uh, I mean that it is not going to be part of a law. It's not legislated, but it is going to be part of the National Highway Transportation Safety Standards. And those safety standards are the requirement for all manufacturers who want to put an automobile on the road in the United States. It covers everything from shatterproof windshields to airbags to, in the very near future, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology. And in fact, General Motors has already committed to putting V2V technology into their 2017 Cadillacs, which roll off the assembly lines this August, just a few short months away. Now, what does V2V do? It broadcasts your speed and your location and your brake status, as I mentioned. And it does so using a variant of Wi-Fi. It's actually 802.11p. And it's broadcasting this in a sphere of about 300 meters. But it's not just vehicle to vehicle. It's also vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to roadside equipment, vehicle to what's known as vulnerable roadside users, or VRUs. These are cyclists, motorcyclists, and even pedestrians. Uh, this is, as you might imagine, would be a mobile application. That would be read only, because what the last thing you want is for, for someone to take their mobile phone enabled with V2V that can broadcast and throw it into the middle of a busy freeway. That's kind of a, one of the threats that uh, we modeled uh, and determined uh, ways to avoid. Now, what this is, is a driver notification system. If, for example, you're driving down uh, an avenue in, in Manhattan, Fifth Avenue, and you have a green light, but there's a taxi cab that's coming across 42nd Avenue and they're blowing through the red light, this system will notify you of the pending danger and, if necessary, apply your brakes to avoid the accident. Now, we've seen similar types of technology being rolled out for low-speed collision avoidance using short-range radar. This is using a variant of Wi-Fi, GPS, and uh, proactive driver no notification to avoid high-speed collisions. Now, here's the promise of V2V. The Department of Transportation has published that it will prevent 76% of non-impaired high-speed collisions. That translates into thousands of lives saved every year. This is the motivation for V2V. In fact, the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary, Anthony Fox, called it the most important safety improvement since the seatbelt. That is quite a statement. Now, typically, folks will have questions at this point in time. 
you know, where are these messages going? Who's storing them? Uh, how can I be sure that my privacy is protected? Can I opt out of the program? And all of these questions are great questions that I'll be glad to answer a little bit later on, and hopefully you have even more. Since this is a technology and a software-based presentation, I'll also note that this system is the largest certificate management system ever conceived. We're going to be talking about 150 million connected cars equipped with V2V in 2022, so we're six short years away. At least in the U.S., the Department of Transportation mandate is 100% compliance by 2022. It's 50% compliance by 2020, 10% by 2018. And as I mentioned, General Motors has already committed to putting V2V technology into their Cadillac series starting this August. Now, what are some of the other concerns? Well, you might say, Ed, you've just spent 20 minutes telling us how, how much software is already in cars and how vulnerable it is. Uh, well, isn't this just introducing one more system that's going to make me even more vulnerable that will allow hackers to take control of my car? Well, the short answer there is no. Yes, this is a software and hardware-based system. And yes, of course, there will be some software defects. However, part of the reason that this is such a safe program is because it is not tied into your steering system. It's a driver notification system. And even though the automobile manufacturers do have the ability to go beyond the baseline requirements, which is driver notification, and, for example, can implement a automatic braking system to avoid the high-speed collisions, it is very difficult to have any kind of tampering with the system because unlike most systems in automotive, uh, this was built with security and privacy from the ground up from the start. And that's very different from most of the other software-based systems where the braking system, for example, started with mechanical brakes and then moved to hydraulic-based brakes uh, and now is mainly uh, uh, digital, electronic, and software-based braking. <clears throat> and that system was developed completely independently of the fuel injection system. And that was developed completely independently of other systems. So what you have in, in autom automobiles is a Frankenstein effect of multiple software-based systems that had to ultimately communicate to each other through a central bus. This is an independent standalone system that is not dependent on any of those other systems. Well, what about terrorists? Will they be able to cause mass havoc? Will they be able to buy a car that's equipped with V2V, take out that, that technology piece, and throw it in the middle of that busy freeway to, to cause havoc? And the answer again there is no. But the system is tied to the automobile itself, and if removed from the automobile, is removed from the system altogether. But what about privacy concerns? Will the, uh, the NSA in, in the United States be monitoring people even more than they are today? Uh, will I be able to, um, or will I be subject to automatic, automatic speeding tickets, etc.? cetera? Uh, again, answers there are no. Part of the reason that these messages that are sent are so private is because they don't have any personally identifiable information. It is broadcasting speed, it's broadcasting location, it's broadcasting uh, brake status, but it's not tying that to your specific vehicle, to you as an individual. And there's no central storage or logging of any of this information. It is broadcast wirelessly through the air in a 300 meter re radius. It's not stored on, on your, uh, in your vehicle, it's not stored in any central location. And as far as issuing you speeding tickets, well, there's a lot easier ways for police to issue speeding tickets today than this system. Uh, will they be able to see that there's a car coming down the road going uh, beyond the speed limit? Yes, of course. But as I mentioned, they can do that today with even more effective uh, technologies such as radar and lasers. 
So I talked a little bit about how messages need to be secure, and they have been built from the ground up with authentication, integrity, and, um, and privacy concerns, uh, using privacy by design as the main, uh, as the main guide, uh, guide for privacy. Uh, but the systems uh, also need to make sure that bad actors can be removed. Uh, for example, if the system is malfunctioning, you need to be able to remove that uh, from the system. And all of, all of these uh, concerns uh, have been built in from the ground up. Well, you can define a system, which is fine, but before you put it into deployment, you should test it, right? Uh, and we have. We started with a pilot in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It started with about 5,000 vehicles and has since been expanded. It's been running since 2012. And these vehicles implemented the standards that were defined in the late 2000s for the V2V program with respect to privacy, security, communication, message handling, etc. There's also a pilot program going on right now in the San Francisco area with all of the BART vehicles, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, such as the buses. And at this moment, I'm actually sitting uh, in Manhattan myself, and there's a program that has commenced in New York City to instrument uh, all of the avenues, and starting next year, all of the taxi cabs and buses and uh, public service vehicles in Manhattan are going to be equipped with V2B, at starting at about 10,000 vehicles. So far, the success of these programs has been excellent. We've had very little uh, failures in terms of having to remove uh, bad actors from the system in terms of equipment failure. Uh, and we have been able to identify um, and, and correlate almost to the, the exact number predicted by the U.S. Department of Transportation, the number of high-speed accidents that had been avoided using the system. In Europe, there are similar programs that are being com contemplated and deployed. Unlike the U.S., where it's a government mandate, in Europe, it's an opt-in program led by the automotive manufacturers as part of a consortium that's called Car-to-Car -car Consortium. As you might imagine, car security has piqued the interest of various government officials. This gentleman on the screen is uh, Senator Ed Markey from the state of uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And he commissioned a report on tracking and hacking that researched security and privacy gaps in connected cars that are putting American drivers at risk. And the result of that research program was that he decided that drivers shouldn't have to choose between being connected and being protected. And so what he did is he got together with uh, another senator, I believe it's um, uh, Rosenthal, and they introduced an act into the um, uh, U.S. legislation called the SPY Act, which I actually think is uh, quite a poor choice of names since it's talking about security and privacy standards, uh, but it stands for the Security and Privacy in Your Car Act. Now, despite the poor choice of names, I do think the program has many merits. Uh, first of all, it defines cybersecurity standards for automotive manufacturers, uh, protection against remote hacking, data security, um, self-attestation with respect to due diligence in software security, uh, privacy standards uh, that need to be transparent and allow for uh, opt-in for customers, uh, prohibiting marketing. Uh, so, for example, as you're driving down the road, uh, you know, what's to prevent you know, someone like a Google from setting up antennas all the way down that road, you know, intercepting these V2V messages and pushing you in-car advertising to say, you know, hey, Sally, hey, John, there's a Starbucks coming up down the road. Aren't you thirsty? Don't you feel like a latte right now? And one of the most interesting parts about the SPY Act, I think, is this dashboard. Uh, it's a window sticker showing how well the car uh, protects the, the driver uh, for security and privacy measures. It's similar to the stickers that are already on new cars 
that will tell you how many miles per gallon it gets and what the carbon footprint of the car is. Uh, so it's a similar analogy that I think uh, has a lot of merit. But there are still some challenges remaining with this program. Uh, the public key infrastructure, uh, governance and, and certification uh, still remains to be defined. In fact, the certificate management system that's being used by General Motors when they put the system into their Cadillac starting in August is the same that is being used for the pilot programs uh, in Ann Arbor and New York City. Uh, it's created and managed by the Collision Avoidance Metrics Program. Uh, it's a government agency called CAMP, as you might imagine. Um, also, the privacy of individuals in, um, need to be considered as the certificates get depleted. The way the system works is messages are signed. They're not encrypted because there's no sensitive data in the messages, but they are signed for authentic uh, authentication uh, and authorization purposes. But as the car is driving around and it's broadcasting 10 times a second, here's my status, uh, here's my, my brake status, here's my location, here's my speed, the number of certificates that that car has uh, preloaded into it gets depleted. And as the certificates get depleted, it's easier to uh, spoof and conduct man-in-the-middle attacks, which means that the cars have to be topped off from time to time. They'll need to be topped off at places such as um, post offices as you're driving by and um, service, service bays uh, from automotive manufacturers, but even intersections you know, common intersections um, will be equipped, you know, infrastructure will be equipped uh, to be able to detect number of certificates uh, in the car and uh, restore them if, uh, if they're getting depleted. Uh, also, cybersecurity measures. This is new hardware and new software being put into, into your cars, so they need to, uh, the, the design and standards uh, have been built with security and privacy in mind, but the automotive supply chain needs to implement those standards properly. Uh, and as we all know, being in the software field, <clears throat> implementing standards uh, is not always done perfectly. Uh, so those considerations are also uh, part of this. And then, of course, cross-border harmonization, uh, whether it's between North America and Japan or Europe and North America. Uh, you know, a common, uh, a popular program is you know, buying your, your BMW um, and then picking it up in Bavaria, driving around the Autobahn for a couple of weeks, and then shipping it back to the States. Well, that car that is manufactured and purchased in Germany needs to work in the U.S. V2V system. Uh, and those harmonization issues are still being worked out. However, there's plenty of reason for optimism. Keep in mind, it's still very difficult to hack a car. And uh, there are other much, much juicier targets available uh, than an individual driving a car. Uh, we are able to leverage many useful parallels in traditional IT infrastructure and software development. Uh, for example, over-the-air software updates is something that the automotive industry is struggling with at, at the, this point in time. However, it's very much a solved problem uh, in IT, so uh, we're, we're trying to leverage a lot of what we've learned in classic software development in IT and apply that to the automotive world. Good news is car makers are being proactive. Uh, General Motors uh, about a year ago um, announced the appointment of its first cybersecurity czar, which is great. Uh, Ford Motor Company uh, last year hired more software engineers than hardware engineers for the first time in its history. Uh, and there are plenty of standards under development, not just from the government, but things like the SPY Act, uh, but also um, automotive manufacturers are working with standards bodies such as IEEE, uh, the Society of Automotive Engineering, and others to develop cybersecurity standards that ultimately can get in, in, into the National Highway Transportation Safety Standards, uh, which is the governing uh, document for all things that need to be put into an automobile in order for it to uh, be put on the roads in the United States. So my final message to you, 40 minutes into this webcast, 
is keep calm and drive. But please be, do, uh, please be aware of this new program, this vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle program, the Talking Cars program, because it is coming to us all, and it's coming to us all sooner than we might think. In fact, if you plan on buying a General Motors Cadillac after August, it's coming to you straight away. So with that, I will leave this slide up here for a moment. It has my contact information on here. As I mentioned earlier, if you want a copy of that Ponemon Institute research report, or if you'd like a copy of this presentation, or if you'd like a free secure coding uh, computer-based training course in the language of your choice, C, C++, .NET, Java, iOS, uh, just let me know. Uh, we've got plenty of those available for you. And part of what we're trying to do, not just with this webinar series, but also the V2V program itself, is a bit of a public service. So folks can start to take cybersecurity seriously and software security seriously. Uh, and we're, it's, it's as much of an education process as it is a technology uh, problem that we're trying to address. So there's my email address, eadams at securityinnovation.com. Uh, and with that, uh, I am going to see if we had any live questions that have uh, popped up uh, during the course of the, we of the webinar. Now, as I'm waiting for some of these uh, questions to come in, uh, I'll comment on a couple of uh, very common, oops, common, common questions that I do get. Um, you know, one, uh, one question that happens uh, frequently is, well, you know, uh, Ed, I drive a 1972 Camaro, and I love my 72 Camaro. I don't want to get it wrecked. You know, can I uh, purchase something to, to get my 72 Camaro into the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle system at some point in time? And the answer is yes. Uh, the, there will be aftermarket devices that will allow you to retrofit uh, auto, automobiles that were made prior to the mandate. Uh, so that, that's one question that I typically get. Another question I often get is um, the, uh, the, the analog to that, which is, can I opt out of this program? Uh, I'm a bit freaked out. I don't like the idea of my car broadcasting at speed and location constantly. Uh, can I opt out of this program? Because I don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, the answer is no in the United States. Once the mandate has been put in place, all U.S. manufactured automobiles need to adhere to it. <clears throat> um, so we do have one question that, that came in from an, an, an audience member asking, what about motorcycles? And that's uh, um, motorcycles uh, are going to be part of the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle program. A motorcycle and its driver is going to be known as a VRU, a Vulnerable Roadside Unit. Uh, I don't know why the government comes up with these crazy acronyms, but they do. So motorcycles are going to be treated similar to uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. And motorcycle manufacturers, um, uh, it, this is going to be a receive-only uh, mode of V2V, as opposed to the broadcast and receive, which is the default in automobiles. Uh, the reason being is that a motorcyclist as, is most at risk uh, when being involved in a car crash, but they pose little risk when crashing into something else. So uh, motorcycles, bicyclists, pedestrians, those are going to be vulnerable roadside units that can opt into this program uh, with, uh, with, with, a, with mobility, with, with a mobile uh, application, basically. And uh, again, it's going to be read only. Uh, so you know, as, as you're cycling down the road uh, and you're on the right-hand you know, lane of, um, of an intersection, uh, and there is a tractor trailer truck that's to your left making a wide right turn, you can be notified of the pending danger. And um, so that's, um, that's part of, of what we're doing for those vulnerable roadside users. So um, with that, we're about 45 minutes into the program. Uh, I don't have any additional questions that have been showing up. So I will thank you for your time, I appreciate your attention, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the PSQT conference in August in San Diego. Thank you all and have a safe day. Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate your uh, time today and I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's free webinar sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. 
For more information on how IIST can help you or your organization, please visit www.iist.org. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more information about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you all again for joining us today, and have a great day.